Thanks for coming to my state of Kentucky. I'm glad you chose to hold your uh, convention here this year. Unlike some parts of the country, in Kentucky you will find that we still hold near and dear the Second Amendment and don't plan on giving it up anytime soon. From concealed carry to hunting to self-defense, Kentuckians are proud, and we do protect our Second Amendment here. When President Obama ran for office, you remember this, he derisively referred to many of us as clinging to our guns and our religion. He got it half right. I say we're clinging to our guns, our religion, and our ammunition. In Kentucky and across the country, I think we're doing a pretty good job defending the Second Amendment. I think conservatives have largely done a good job defending the Second Amendment. Like many conservatives across the South, I'm a defender of the Second Amendment. If you don't believe me, come to my house unannounced. <laughs> Over the past few years, we've won some great legal victories. Remember the McDonald case, the Heller case. The court affirmatively said that the Second Amendment applies to cities and states. No longer can cities like D.C. or Chicago trample on our gun rights. But you know, progressives won't stop. They continue to try to limit our gun rights. It's as if the other side doesn't even think there is a Second Amendment sometimes. Whether through executive overreach, bad legislation, or the news media and their propaganda, defending the Second Amendment is a full-time job, and we need more defenders in Washington. One suggestion I have, though, is to make sure that we remind the left at every turn that the Second Amendment is a vital part of the Bill of Rights. I think sometimes, both left and right, we single out the Second Amendment and the public forgets that the Second Amendment is a fundamental right, that our founding fathers found it so precious that they included it in our Bill of Rights. Our defense of the Second Amendment should always remind liberals that the right to bear arms is right next to the right to free speech, to the right to practice your religion, and the right to freely associate with your friends and neighbors. We should never, and I mean never, let them relegate the Second Amendment to any second tier of rights. And we must always remember that the Second Amendment can only properly be defended when we defend the rest of the Bill of Rights. You can't defend the Second Amendment unless you defend the First Amendment. If, if we diminish one iota the right to free speech, we risk not having the voice to defend the right to bear arms. If we diminish one iota the right to be free from unreasonable search, we risk our right to bear arms. If we allow the government to enter our homes or to search our records without a warrant, we risk undermining not just our Second Amendment rights, but the entire Bill of Rights. I won't let this happen. I will stand for as long as it takes to keep the government out of our private lives. I will stand for as long as it takes to protect each and every American's right to be left alone. In the Senate, I fought to protect the entire Bill of Rights. The right to own a gun is not a historic relic. It's a vital, enduring right of free men and women. Our founders saw gun ownership as the ultimate defense against tyranny. Our founders could not imagine a government that would ban self-determination or self-defense. 
At its core, the Second Amendment is about something incredibly personal, the right to be able to protect your family and your friends. The debate over gun ownership arises with every new tragedy. None of us are immune, immune to the heart-wrenching pain of seeing children slaughtered. But we must ask ourselves, how can we best protect our children and protect our rights? The debate over these senseless mass murders, painful as it has been, has brought some insight. These terrible, recurring tragedies keep occurring in one place, gun-free zones. These terrible tragedies keep happening in areas that we have pre-announced are defenseless. Look, I've got children. I can't imagine one of my kids being killed at school by a deranged killer. But as a physician, I was trained to solve problems, to get beyond emotions and find answers. For the life of me, I can't imagine how we can legislate away evil. I can imagine, though, how we can remove the obstacles to self-defense. I think one way to try to avoid these senseless killings would be to announce once and for all time that no school, no movie theater, no supermarket in America will be left defenseless. Once and for all time, government should remove all legal barriers from allowing our children and our schools to have defense against these killers. The media, they trumpet gun control as an answer to evil, but rarely do they let us see the other side of the story, where self-defense saves lives. They don't often tell the story of a couple in Sultan, Washington, sitting in their house watching TV, when an intruder broke in and stabbed the 75-year-old husband in his home, only to be shot seconds later by his gun-wielding 80-year-old wife. They don't talk about the Tampa, Florida maintenance worker in a church who stopped an armed robber with his own weapon and then kept him captive until the police arrived. They don't talk about Chris Gaither from Talladega, Alabama. Chris was alone in his house when someone broke in to rob them. Chris fired his 9mm weapon and struck the burglar, thwarting the robbery and protecting himself. What they also don't want to tell you is that Chris is 11 years old. As far as I'm concerned, they raised them pretty well down in Alabama. <laughs> These stories and thousands like them happen every day across America. The story they tell is crystal clear. There is no better defense against evil than self-defense. If more law-abiding citizens could own and carry a weapon, good people would have a fighting chance to defend themselves. Ask the unarmed citizens of Chicago, New York, and yes, our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., if they would feel safer with a firearm. I know I would, but the red tape is such that it's almost impossible to get a gun in D.C. A month or so ago, the D.C. police chief warned us. She said that if there's an active shooter, take them down. I responded to her with what? My bare hands? It's almost impossible to get a gun in D.C. Guns stop crimes. It has been estimated that over two million crimes are stopped every year by law-abiding citizens with guns. The town of Kennesaw, Georgia passed a law a few years back requiring the heads of households to own a firearm. Home robberies, home robberies fell 89%. 
It's not rocket science. Though you would think so if you listen to the gun grabbers and the liberal media, more guns with good guys equals less crime. Period. I've spent a large part of my time in the Senate fighting for the Second Amendment. As we speak, President Obama is trying to take gun rights from our senior citizens and our veterans. Simply by combing through records and taking away gun rights from anyone who has requested that their family help them with their finances, or from veterans with PTSD. I'll be damned before I'll let the government take guns from the very veterans who fought to preserve this country. This year, I sponsored a bill to stop Barack Obama's unconstitutional attempt to take gun rights from our senior citizens and our veterans. I've also sponsored the Defend Our Capital Act, which provides concealed carry for Washington, D.C. Funny story about that one. I proposed the bill as an amendment to the entire D.C. budget. The liberals were not amused. The committee chair and the Democrats on the committee nearly lost their minds, mostly because they, they knew that if we had the vote, I was going to win. They couldn't stand the possibility that you could have concealed carry in D.C. They pulled the entire budget down. Rather than even vote on the budget or vote on my amendment, they just pulled the whole thing down. I still get hateful looks from the D.C. delegate. I don't mind making other people uncomfortable if it's in the defense of liberty. I will do whatever is necessary to defend our God-given rights. Twice in the last three years, I held up the entire Senate to defend your right to be left alone. I stood on the Senate floor for nearly 13 hours to defend the idea that we are innocent until proven guilty. I believe that each of the rights listed in the Bill of Rights depend upon each other. That's why I tell people, you won't have the Second Amendment very much longer if you don't start protecting the Fourth Amendment. I filibustered to stop the unconstitutional spying on Americans that threatens our freedoms. We must remain vigilant. A government that can violate your rights, a government that can spy on you without a warrant and then lie to you about it, that's a government that might someday just come to take your guns. The Bill of Rights protects us all, but it only if we stand up for the entire Bill of Rights. I've stood against Democrats and some Republicans trying to trample your rights. I was among the first to sound the alarm on the United Nations Small Arms Treaty and its threat to our gun rights and to our sovereignty. Now millions of Second Amendment supporters have made their voices heard on this topic and we're winning the battle. We cannot, we cannot let our legislators, our executive or unelected globalist bureaucrats at the UN take away our gun rights. I'd like to end with a quote from Thomas Jefferson who said, no free man shall ever be debarred the use of arms. Our country was founded by the people who fought to establish and preserve our rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are secured by the Second Amendment. They knew it. You and I know it. 
Let's carry that message from coast to coast this year and make sure everyone remembers it. Thank you, and God bless, and save this republic. <laughs>